Oh, you've gone and done it now. You have clicked on the next installment in Rob and Steve's Traditional Knife Anthology. And this one, the fourth knife in the series. I've been keeping a little bit of a secret, haven't I? I haven't had a really good look at this knife, even in the introduction. Check this out, boys. It's not a case. It's not a GEC. It's a Queen. Queen City Cutlery Company. Queen Classic, to be exact. Stay tuned. We'll crack open the box and check out this beauty. Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 28 May 2014 and yes, we are going to talk about, look at, examine a QCCC Queen Classic traditional pocket knife tonight. And oh man, just get ready. Get ready. We're going to open the box. Oh, here it is. Got to be careful. Queen uses a sort of case-like tissue paper to wrap their knives in, and it is a little fragile. So let's get the box out of the camera and feast your eyes, my friends, on this. Before I start yapping, I just want to give you a nice 360 of this gorgeous, gorgeous, large Congress knife from Queen. Would you look at what the light does with this knife? Mm. Look at those abalone covers. It looks like they're 10 feet deep, doesn't it? Man. No gaps. Everything's beautifully flush. Oh, I'm going to set this down. And we're going to just zoom in a little bit on this girl. Well, you kind of ogle her while I'm talking. I'm going to read, as usual, in this anthology in conjunction with Steve at how about the truth? I'm going to read his letter, the portion of his letter that pertains to this beautiful knife. Should we open some blades, perhaps, while we're... Oh. Ooh. While I'm talking, just to take a peek. Just enjoy looking at her. Okay, fourth knife, says Steve. The Queen quote unquote classic number 32, Big Congress <coughs> in Abalone. Only Mike Latham, that's Mike Latham at Collectors, uh, CollectorKnives.net, has these from this run in 2009. No Abalones are left. But he still has them in orange or brown, winter bottom bone, ebony, red bone, and green bone. I agree with Mike. These are the sweetest big Congress knives made by anyone. Underlined. D2 steel. It's got the smoothest walk and talk on all four blades. Look at all those old tang stamps. And we will look at them. On all four blades, Steve notes, both sides. 
uh, unusual for Queen. The bow tie shield with the QCCC were the first shields ever used. This shield was retired in 1928. <coughs> All nickel silver parts in this knife, meaning bolsters and all the rivets and pins are nickel silver. There is no blade rub in this knife and we will examine that closely as we go over the knife too. He's, Mike says that's rare for a Congress knife. I would say that's unheard of for anybody's Congress knife except Queen. Uh, Mike couldn't remember the production totals for these. He did say that the abalones are always the lowest in numbers. Um, Pricing wise, the ones that are left in the bone handles will be close to a hundred bucks, but not quite actually. Um, so that's what we know from Steve. And as actually kind of coincidentally, I had a chance to talk with Mike Latham today. I'm going to back up here. I was actually calling him about another knife. First time I've ever had a conversation on the phone with Mike. But I did talk to him a little bit about the background of Queen. And there's actually a little blurb Mike wrote for his website, CollectorKnives.net, that goes into the Queen story in some pretty good detail. But I, and guys, I encourage you to read it. Queen is probably not a cutlery manufacturer most of us are super familiar with. And they do have a pretty cool story. Man. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background as I know it. <clears throat> so we can kind of know where this knife comes from. So Queen is a really old knife company. Um, and their history actually before 1980 or so is a little sketchy. And we, we know them for the knives that they built in other names. Um, I believe some of the Remington knives, the Winchester knives of the 80s and 90s were contract built by Queen. Much like the old uh, uh, Imperial Cutlery, even Ontario, who comes into this picture as we talk about the decade of the 80s. Uh, a lot of knives built for companies who make other things besides knives who like to have a knife with their name on it, contracted some of these old Pennsylvania and New York traditional knife makers to make knives for them. And Queen really uh, became a profitable company in the 80s and 90s by doing just that. Even some of the Case Classics that were manufactured during Jim Parker's uh, time owning Case were manufactured by Queen. The Shatton Morgan nameplate manufactured by Queen. Um, and as some of that contract work started to dry up, and sometime in the early 80s, they had been purchased by Ontario's parent company. I believe it's called Servotronics. It's an old defense contractor uh, in whose ownership Queen remained until just a couple years ago, 2010, I think, 10 or 11. So when the contract work started to dry up, Servotronics said, well, guys, keep building knives. We're going to put Queen on them. And so sometime in the early 90s, uh, guys who were still <laughs> appreciating traditional knives sort of rediscovered Queen as they made some pretty good stuff for a long time. And that continued for the better part of a couple decades. And then it's a little sketchy as to why, but sometime in the, oh, in the early 2000s, quality really started going downhill. Some of these special runs, like this large Congress knife, were always maintained. It's almost like there was a, a special crew who made these knives, and some of the rest of the production got to be pretty shoddy. <laughs> but by uh, 2010, the company really found itself in trouble and Ken Daniels, former employee of Queen, or I guess a former, uh, well, he was involved financially in Queen uh, prior to this and had helped Bill Howard start Great Eastern Cutlery, most of Ken's money. Uh, after selling his interest in GEC and kind of going back to the 
heavy equipment tire business where he made most of his money, a <coughs> knife nut though he was, he, I guess, found out Queen was struggling and made a bid to purchase it and did, in fact, purchase it. However, um, doesn't seem like Ken really has a lot of time for Queen Cutlery, nor does his son. The Daniels family sort of owns and operates it, but uh, probably not as well as they would like to. But at least it was in the hands of a conservator of, uh, of the cutlery business. And it, it remains in the Daniels family ownership even today. This knife, though, made in 2009 before Daniels ownership. So this is kind of one of the last special runs, serialized number 41 of this run. We don't know something less than 100. Uh, so this is one of the last great knives under the dying old ownership of Queen. And... Here's the thing that's kind of bothersome. When I was talking to Mike today, I was actually inquiring about another queen knife, a large stockman in Mother of Pearl and Abalone, because I kind of wanted to find out, okay, Mike, you know, where, what vintage did it come from? Do I need to have concerns about it? And so we got to talking. And the sad thing is, apparently the present day isn't looking too bright for queen. Uh, although the Danielses do own queen cutlery, uh, it's not really demanding enough of their time to make much of a difference. And uh, Mike kind of sees the quality going downhill again. In fact, he told me that he kind of, he sends back for repair or replacement basically half the queen knives that come into his, uh, come into stock in his online shop. So this might be one of the last opportunities to own the pinnacle of large Congress knife craftsmanship, uh, not only from Queen, but from anybody. So let's pull these blades out now and go over them. I'm gonna do a wipe here. Let's go over them in detail. <clears throat> you got two large blades, one sheep's foot. And let's look at these tang stamps. Would you look at that? Look at that Queen City script logo. And guys, we'll be able to make this out when we watch the video better than I can now through the viewfinder. <clears throat> that must be the Queen Cutlery Crest. Blades are D2. <clears throat> you might notice a little bit of inconsistency in polish. D2 does tend to orange peel a little bit, kind of like VG10. And on this sheep's foot blade... We've got a little orange peel on one side, a little, a little less orange peel on this laser etched side. Ah, now I can read it. It is the Queen logo with Titusville PA on that tank stamp. On the sheep's foot blade, we've got a nice sharpening notch. Our bevel grind is scant, but sharp. Pretty thin behind the edge. Notice the offset of the grind. Congress knives do this. You look at them from the spine and they look a little wonky because these grinds are precisely designed for all these blades to fall together without liners in a minimal amount of space. See how the point of one blade nests sort of in the ricasso of the one opposite it? Pretty cool. And then the other sort of main blade is more of a Warncliffe than a sheep's foot. Again, nice sharpening notch. Same Queen City script logo. And the same Titusville PA logo on the other side. Again, beautifully ground blade. Decent edge. And then we've got two pen blades almost identical that's a great shot you can see both tang stamps looking at the same side gorgeous pen blades I didn't really 
read the laser etch. Oh yeah, we've got the Queen City, Queen City Cutlery Company. Classic abalone. So it's almost the same logo that is on the box. The same shield and streamer. It's a little different verbiage. But guys, what I really want to get to on this knife is the action. I was talking to Mike about this on the phone today. Uh, we're so used to case knives with, you know, no half stops and kind of slushy opening. And, you know, we've grown used to, over these last few years, Great Eastern Cutlery knives with, let's face it, uh, pretty heavy actions. Great walk and talk, but very heavy actions. This knife is something different than both of those. It's The, the blades have a very free action, but what, look how they hit the half stops. I'm going to... And Mike was talking about this. He says, when a blade hits dead on the half stop and doesn't move, you know the knife's too tight. But when you rock it to the half stop and it kind of over travels and springs back, you know, like, like Roadrunner coming to a stop, that's when you know you got kind of the right one. And that's what these knives do. I don't know if you can really see it on camera. You can definitely see it with the the naked eye. I don't know if my camera is fast enough to pick it up. But it kind of hits the half stop and goes a little bit past it and then and the feel it's super free and super positive. I mean it just kind of finds that half stop all by itself and just it really inspires confidence. You know if you're kind of closing the knife with the thumb there you can see that sort of bounce off the half stop. It's so smooth. I mean, oh. A video is not going to do this justice. It's almost like a, if a GEC knife were like um, a cold steel, this knife would be like a Sebenza, if that makes sense to you modern folder guys. Um, it's just a different, more refined, more luxurious knife. Wow. I'm going to open all this thing up and let's take a look inside. Try to do this without cutting yourself. Okay, now I haven't cleaned this or anything and I know Steve keeps it really well oiled, but just very well made. Remember this knife's been sitting around for five years. Don't know what the back springs are made of. But Steve, if you know, or if any of you guys watching knows, don't hesitate to tell us. Don't know if they're a carbon steel or if they're D2 as well. Probably not stainless. You know what? Let's in, in honor of Mike Latham at CollectorKnives.net. Let's open this Mike Latham style. Oh. <laughs> he he makes me cringe on every one of his videos. If you guys watch his little 360 videos, he always opens to the half stop and then he puts the pad of his thumb on the cutting edge and opens it the rest of the way. Uh, you can't do this after I sharpen one. Trust me. Just look at the precision that has to go into making that knife without any rub. And guys, I got to tell you, I'm not a big Congress knife fan, blade wipe time. I'm not a big Congress knife fan because of that. Uh, even my little medium sized case Stockman. Three blader has blades running into each other all over the place. I don't like it. Uh, it doesn't happen on this guy. One more quick look around before we close. Oh man, if you like folding knives, you gotta love this thing. 
that is all for tonight, my friends. And this is the last one of the first batch from Steve. How about the truth for the traditional knives anthology? So these will be getting packaged up tomorrow and sent back to Florida. And I can't wait to see what he sends us next. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the word is sharp.